So in part two, we're going to describe pretty much the different processes uh, that the urine, that, that the body is going to use, the kidneys are going to use <clears throat> for urine formation. Uh, we're going to talk about the factors that influences this. Uh, we're going to talk about filtration pressures. And remember, in filtration, water is major one, right? Same thing as your osmotic pressure. And we're going to talk about the hormones influencing this uh, concentration of urine and uh, volume regulation as well. At this moment, I'm not teaching you anything new. I'm just, we are applying the hormones that you already know for the endocrine system into different aspects of how filtration can happen and how do you regulate that. No new hormones will be given to you. Okay? So you already know this part. Now we're just applying information. So the main process of your information is going to be filtration. We also are going to have reabsorption. And then finally, we're going to have secretion. So three main processes, right? So what is the process of filtration? You're filtering through a small, tiny, three structures that we cover. There are the fenestrated endothelium, visceral podocytes, and basement membrane. Three structures that makes the filter. So, in able to do filtration, you require what? Blood, and that will be blood plasma. And with that blood comes what? Pressure. Remember that the kidneys, they don't work with a high pressure, they work with a lower pressure. So, that pressure is known as what? The pressure of water, so that's known as hydrostatic pressure. Number, normally, uh, small molecules can actually pass through these tiny or microscopic pores, right? So waste and useful solutes means both. Whenever you have an excess of ions, then these ions have a higher chances of going through these microscopic pores if they fit to them, correct? So what things do not fit? Same things that did not fit when we did the process of what? Of getting blood plasma into the tissue. What do we call that? Perfusion, remember that? So, big things like what? What are the big things in there? The form elements, right? Your red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets should not be there, should not, right? If everything is 100% effective, which is not, right? So, large solutes are going to be suspended and these materials will be what? Retained, right? They cannot pass through the filter. In reabsorption, okay, uh, that will be uh, removal of water and anything that is what useful solutes where are you reabsorbing into you are reabsorbing back into your blood circulation right remember the peritubular capillaries and the vasa recta that we mentioned so this is actually a type of process that is what selective so your body selects what ions in excess or what iron is required at the moment. So if it's required and you need it, you're gonna reabsorb it back through the peritubular capillaries or vasa recta. <coughs> Most of these materials that are going to be reabsorbed are going to be what? Nutrients, all right, that the body is needed at this moment. Again, you cannot wait until you get another piece of food or you can get, or you can get some water or any other type of electrolytes because you need it when? Now, that's why this reabsorption process is important. The last one is secretion, and is secretion is actually the same transport of solutes, but most likely this is for what? Waste that did not pass by the first time it got filtered. Because again, how many of you are 100% effective? None of us. How many of your organs is 100% effective? None of them are, right? So there's always going to be some sort of waste materials that are going to be left over in your bloodstream. So we don't filter everything, right? We filter 90 something percent, but we don't filter everything. So the second round, it passes again, because how many times does blood passes to your kidney in one day? We said 200 liters, right? And you have, wow, 4.5, let's say five liters, right? Do the math. Four times five, 20, right? So it's about 40 times in a single day that your blood circulates to your kidney. So if it's not the first time, it's the second time, if not the third or the fourth or the fifth, 
right? Because it keeps circulating because one day to the next day to the next day, right? Uh, so that's how your body does it. So that's the process of secretion. So secretion is you're going to have your waste and they're going to be secreted in the renal tubule. Whatever ends up to be in the renal tubule, that's going to be what? A waste product, right? Waste means what? Part of your urine. Whatever is on the renal tubule already, any part of the renal tubules, proximal, distal, or the loop of Henle, right, or collecting duct, whatever is in there, if your body requires it at a certain moment in time before you made urine, right, before you put that liquid out of the collecting duct, then you can do what to it? You can use it, right, and you can reabsorb it. So far is good, but understand whatever is in the tubules, proximal, loop, distal, or collecting duct could be potentially what? Reabsorb if your body requires at that moment. <coughs> so for filtration to take place, you require what? The hydrostatic pressure that we measured before, right? So that hydrostatic pressure is the pressure what? Of your blood plasma because your blood is composed of what? Form elements and plasma. So within the plasma, most of it is made out of water. So that's what becomes the hydrostatic pressure. And by the pressure going through your filter, okay, filter is, again, your podocytes, basement membrane, and your vesicles. So understand, these are no more than called what? Where that process of filtration will take place is at this side right here. And let me make it lighter for you. So this is the side with a different color. That's where filtration takes place, at the filtration slit. These is what makes the tiny pores and all the blood plasma will be filtered through them. Okay. So Within the renal tubules, right, since we mentioned renal tubules, what are these renal tubules? Well, the renal tubules are the proximal convoluted tubules, the descending limb, or ascending limb of what? Of your loop of Henle. Then you have whatever is proximal, then you have a distal convoluted tubule, and finally you have a collecting duct. Again, a collecting duct can collect for multiple, right, nephrons. So your nephron is up to the distal convoluted tubule. So far is it good? So when you're making urine, uh, blood is going to be recycled, is gonna pass through your kidneys about 40 times, right, in a single day, correct? So all that blood that is in here, which is this, one right here, that it's going to go through the process that we know as what? Filtration, correct? Whatever is being filtered and is not needed at the moment or is in excess or is a waste product that fitted through those filtration slits, then it's gonna end up where? Proximal convoluted tubule. From there, your proximal convoluted tubules are going to reabsorb some things like what like sodium potassium chloride right your sugars right your glucose is going to be reabsorbed mostly in there we're going to talk about it in a little more detail later and then as you go into the descending limb of henley this one if you see it becomes you have a thick portion right here and you have a what a thin portion right there now the thin segment of the loop of henley is about the same size or the same diameter as the thick portion. The difference is in the amount of what? Cells around it, okay? But the lumen is pretty much the same. So, lumen, the same. What does the descending limb of loop of Henley do? Basically, as shown here, water what? Reabsorption, okay? Now, on the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, on that thick segment, that's going to be made out of cuboidal cells, and there is no water reabsorption at this level. Okay. 
So on the ascending one, there's no water reabsorption. It's just, just exceptions. Water is most likely to take place reabsorption of water is throughout, but the exception is ascending head. On the distal cumulative tubule, you're going to reabsorb further more ions, like your sodium. So the process of aldosterone, so how aldosterone works is that it works on the distal convoluted tubule, and at that place is where they're going to stimulate the reabsorption of sodium. And that mainly takes place on the distal convoluted tubule. Does that mean that the proximal does not reabsorb sodium? It does, but most of it mainly is on the distal end. So learn the distal convoluted tubule of sodium reabsorption and the problem with what? I'm sorry, and the activation with aldosterone, correct? Finally, in the collecting duct, and what are you be collecting? Well, we are actually collecting pretty much all the waste products and excess products that we don't need. And that's going to be diluted into water because again, you are reabsorbing water into back in your body, but you're also putting water into the tubule. So you can move all these ions, correct? Because if you leave all the sodiums by themselves and you take all the water out, you end up with what? With a rock. So think about this. How do you create kidney stones? And kidney stones are the position of ions that are being dehydrated completely. You take all the water out, and as the ions get together, it creates a piece of rock, right? So we call that a kidney stone, okay? So look at this arrow right here. It says secretion, right? Is an orange arrow. So you have secretion in a couple of places right, all across in the proximal, distal, and collecting duct. So water is always being what? Secreted in there so you can dilute the ions in the tubules. So far so good? Okay. Now, what are we actually doing? Well, we are starting the process and the formation of urine. So urine formation begins at the level of where? Your glomerulus. Which one is your glomerulus? This structure right here is known as your glomerulus. Okay. So your information begins at the level of the glomerulus. Now, urine, once urine, uh, once the uh, this fluid, this collection of water and ions leave the papillary duct, okay, remember the minor major papilla, right? So you have entering the renal papilla into the minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, and ureter, that means that that is your urine that is leaving the body. So when do you truly have urine? Well, urine is beginning, is at the glomerulus, right? Urine formation. Once you pass the collecting duct, you cannot reabsorb this because it's already urine. Does that make sense? You have no way of reabsorbing this by another blood vessels. That's for the anatomy and physiology that I know so far. Because remember, there's always something new. But uh, the renal papilla, so once you get this out of the collecting duct, then you're going to have the urine entering where? Again, this is the actual true urine, right? And that is the process that the urine takes all the way out of your body. So you should be able to do what? Describe the process in order. So what is the true order? You have afferent, arterioles, glomerulus, okay? Proximal convoluted tubule, descending, ascending loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, collecting duct, renal papilla, minor calyx, major calyx, Renal pelvis, ureter, what am I missing? Urinary bladder and urethra. So far so good? So you should be able to do that. Now let's go and talk a little bit into more detail about glomerular filtration rate. So what is glomerular filtration rate? In able to filter the urine, we require what? A filter. How do we make the filter? What are the structures in the filter? You have your visceral protocyte, your basal lamina or basement membrane, and you have 
that endothelium, right? Your glomerular capillaries that makes this fenestrations. So three layers that allow this to take place. So what makes my actual filtration or the actual filter, like the filter that you put on the water, you change the filter. The filter is made by fenestrations in the capillaries, a dense layer, and key true filtration slits, right? So these are actually the layers that you need to understand. So let's go into a little bit detail about this ones. So if you look, we have the blood vessel, right? And blood goes pretty much towards there and into your kidney. And that's the same one that we see here, right? So these two are the same. As blood goes in there and the hydrostatic pressure increases, because there's the plasma in there, you actually are trying to filter that through these tiny pores. The tiny pores are known as filtration slits. You also have a fenestrations, which are again, all their tiny pores in the lumen of your blood vessels. And all of that has to pass through your basement membrane, which is this one right here, your vase hall, which will be your vaso lamina. Okay? So that is the process of filtration. And that process requires, again, your afferent arterioles that combine and creates your glomerulus. And now you are filtering between your glomerulus and what? Well, this is your glomerulus right here, correct? What is this layer right here? So here we know that this is your glomerulus, right? What is this layer right here? That is known as your Bowman's, Bowman's, what? Space. So filtration, because the actual capsule is called the renal capsule, right? Or Bowman's capsule. Uh, the space is where actually filtration takes place between the glomerulus and the Bowman space. So as you increase the amount of hydrostatic pressure that goes in here, right, that pressure will allow for the filtered filtrate to actually be filtered in between your glomerulus and Bowman space. Can you picture that? Now, how is this possible? Well, it is possible because you have what? Hydrostatic pressure. And this hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure, and I believe we talked about this already, right? So you have plasma proteins. The plasma proteins are going to cause what in there? Plasma proteins, are they big or small? Most of them are kind of big, right? So they do not go through these filtration slits. So inside here, these plasma proteins are going to create a osmotic pressure. So the osmotic pressure is increasing here, yes? And remember, osmotic pressure is the one that pulls the water towards that side, correct? If you have an increased hydrostatic pressure, then the increase in hydrostatic pressure will cause this to do what? To push the filtrate out into the capsular space. Correct? Whenever you're doing that, you are creating a what? A net filtration what? Pressure. Does that mean that everything that goes through there, through that push of hydrostatic pressure, is going to get filtered? Yes, but there is tiny of it of reabsorption that takes place. Why? Because since you have a hydrostatic, since you have a somatic pressure, right, of these plasma proteins, some of these things are going to reabsorb back, and some of that thing means what? Mainly your water. Okay, and some of that iron. Does that make sense? 
But again, filtration between the glomerulus and the Bowman space. So let's talk a little bit about these things. Here you have on top where you have the highest amount of hydrostatic pressure, and here we have the highest amount of what? Autosmotic pressure, right? So you're pushing things out, but you're also trying to get them back towards the blood. Because if you think about this, if you put all the blood out and you filter everything, that means that all the water is leaving your blood, now you're gonna have a low blood volume, correct? So you wanna be able to reabsorb some of that back. So that's why that osmotic pressure is gonna reabsorb a little bit of some of that water back into the bloodstream so you will not have a decrease in blood volume and decrease in blood pressure. Because if not, everything's gonna end up in your kidney. And that exactly is what happens when these fenestrating capillaries, whenever these capillaries, and let me just write it here, so I'm just mimicking this part right here. So normally you have something like this with tiny fenestrations, correct? So the filter can go through here, correct? Whenever you have a renal damage, right? What's going to happen? Well, these things are going to get what? The spaces are going to get a lot bigger. That means that now, the protein that did not fit through here, it now is able to do what? Fit through here, right? The reblo cell that did not fit through here, now this reblo cell can fit through there, correct? So as you damage your kidney because of a high blood pressure or because of an autoimmune disease or because of an infection, right, is damaging this filtration slits. And as they get bigger, you actually filter more things. And that's not quite a good thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So eventually, as you damage the percentage or the population of glomeruli in your kidneys, then this may lead to a renal failure. How do we know this? How do we calculate this? And that is calculated by the following triangle on the bottom. So what's the formula for that one? You have a glomerular filtration rate, and this glomerular filtration rate gives you, right, that is a filtration fraction times the renal plasma flow. What does this mean? So all this thing is saying is that, what is your glomerular filtration rate? If you think about it, glomerular, what does that mean? Your glomerulus, right? The structure of the glomerulus. So that is your glomerulus. What does the S stand for? Filtration, right? So what is filtration? Is the amount of things that you filter through those filtration slits. And rate, what is a rate? A rate is in what? Always in? in time, right? So it's pretty much the amount of blood plasma that you were able to filter across the glomerulus into the Bowman space or capsular space in 15 seconds, 24 hours, five minutes, etc. Does that make sense? So all they're saying is that's the blood plasma that you filter. That's what GFR stands for, glomerular filtration rate. Then you have the other one, which is known as filtration fraction. What is a filtration fraction? Well, filtration, I guess, is what you filter, right? What solutes went across the glomerulus. And fraction, every time you have a fraction, is based on a total, correct? So what is your total? The total is the total amount of what? Volume of plasma that reaches your kidney, correct? Out of that total, what fraction of that got through? In other words, if I have 100 cc's of blood entering my glomerulus and only 80 cc's made it, which one is your filtration fraction? 80, right? That portion, that difference between the two, that is what got filtered. So if 80 went through, those are the 80s that got filtered. This is your filtration fraction. What is your total amount of blood? Plasma, the 100 cc's. Do you get it? 
That's what the fraction stands for. The next one is your renal plasma flow. What is renal plasma flow? This is straightforward. Renal is your kidney, plasma is your blood plasma, and flow is how much of that blood, of your blood, flew through the kidney. Well, hopefully, you want it to flow what? 100%, right? That's the total amount of what? Of plasma that got through the kidney. Out of that 100, how much of it got filtered? We said what? 80 cc's, right? We said 80 cc's. Let's call this one uh, 80%. So out of the 100 blood, blood, blood plasma that went through, only 80% of that got through, got filtered. What is this 100 and what is this 80? The 100 is what? Your renal plasma flow. That is the total amount. Okay? Now, what is your 80%? Is whatever it got? Filter. So this is your filtration fraction. Everybody got that? So now we'll be talking about the vascular resistance in microcirculation and how do we maintain our glomerular filtration rate. As mentioned before, uh, we have a glomerular filtration rate that it was equal to your filtration fraction. As we mentioned before, filtration fraction is how much of that blood plasma is being filtered out of the total amount. And you have your renal plasma flow. And your renal plasma flow, this will be the total amount of blood plasma that enters your afferent arteriole. So out of the total amount of the blood plasma that enters your afferent arteriole, how much of that is going to get filtered across? So the one that's gonna get filtered across, that is your filtration fraction. Please understand that your plasma proteins, they are not filtered. Uh, most of your red blood cells and white blood cells are not either because they are too big to pass through these filtration slits. And they are uh, hold within the glomerulus to maintain your oncotic or osmotic pressure to get a return from the blood plasma of the water component that is here that is going to go now back into your glomerulus. So that is known as your capsular hydrostatic pressure. In other words, as you filter the blood, that is your hydrostatic pressure that is in your blood end in the plasma. As you filter, you're filtering not only the ions that are in excess, but as well as the water in there. As you do so, then there is more accumulation of water on the Bowman space or capsular space. And then that water that is being accumulated causes a increase in now your capsular hydrostatic pressure. And then this pressure would just allow for reabsorption of, <clears throat> will allow for reabsorption of water in back into the bloodstream as well as your colloid or osmotic pressure, which is the pressure exerted by your proteins inside the glomerulus. So you're gonna be reabsorbing something back at the level of the glomerulus. So two forces that oppose filtration between the glomerulus and the Bowman space. The forces are the blood colloid osmotic pressure and your capsular hydrostatic pressure. Now the number one factor that actually governs this filtration <clears throat> at the capillary end is the total surface area. Because the more surface area we have, the more amount of glomerulus that we have, then there greater the possibility of filtrating. 
we also have how much of that filter goes through these fenestration capillaries, how much of that is permeable. So the permeability of the membrane and the solute as well that goes through there. Other factor that affects is your net filtration pressure. You don't want a low filtration pressure because none of the ions are gonna go through or least amounts. If you increase too much of the pressure, then nothing is going to get filtered and you probably will end up damaging the glomerulus. So on the step <clears throat> number two, as mentioned before, uh, that is the amount of blood plasma that reaches your glomerulus. And step number three is your GFR, which is a GFR is directly proportional to the net filtration pressure. So how's the GFR directly proportional to the net filtration pressure? The more pressure you exert on the plasma that is going across the glomeruli, you should have a increase in filtration rate. On step number four here, we see that there is, as the renal afferent arterioles um, receive blood, they by themselves are able to regulate the amount of volume and or pressure of blood or plasma that this net filtration can cause in the glomerulus. So in other words, if your volume of blood is increased, that means that <clears throat> your pressure will increase at the afferent arterioles. What is your afferent arteriole going to do? They are going to produce a vasodilation. So in other words, your blood vessels are going to dilate and by making a increase in the diameter of the vessel, the pressure should decrease. This is your pressure of your plasma. Or we can say plasma pressure. And it's the same event. If you have a lot of water going, going into a water faucet, at the tip of the water faucet, you have the tip of the water hose. If you open the tip a little more, then the pressure will decrease, even though you have more volume of water. On the other instance, if the amount of blood or net filtration, the amount of blood that is entering here is increased in, if the amount of blood that is entering here, it has a decrease in volume, most likely your pressure should decrease with it. What does your afferent arterioles can do? And then this can happen in both afferent or an or efferent. So you don't want to have a low pressure because then your glomerular pressure, your glomerular filtration rate will decrease. So now you're going to produce a vasoconstriction. By constricting the vessel, the diameter will be decreased and then your pressure, your plasma pressure would increase. What are we doing this? Uh, we're doing this just to maintain the amount of glomerular filtration rate. 
So if the pressure So if the pressure is increased, the afferent arterioles are going to dilate to lower the pressure. If the pressure is decreased, then your afferent arterioles are going to constrict. And this has happened constantly. And that is the fact to we can maintain a glomerular filtration rate by maintaining a net filtration pressure what happens at the efferent arterioles if you have a increasing pressure then your proximal your efferent arterioles here are going to produce a dilation. And the afferent arterioles are going to produce a dilation effect as well. Because you want this pressure to be maintained at a net filtration pressure. If the pressure increases, you can damage your glomerulus. So when you damage your glomerulus, you actually are going to have an increased risk of developing a renal failure as more and more glomerulus get, becomes damaged. And this is something that uh, happens constantly in hypertensive individuals that do not take their blood pressure medication. On the other hand, if the amount of pressure that reaches your afferent arteriole is decreased, then you are going to produce a vasoconstriction. So you can maintain your net filtration pressure. And you don't want everything to get out. You want to filter more. So you're going to produce a vasoconstriction as well because there's less amount of pressure or less amount of volume going in. And that again is just to maintain your GFR, glomerular filtration rate. So what medications can affect this? Well, you have your NSAIDs, which is your aspirin, right? Your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory ones. So your prostaglandins, they, what they do is that they are going to dilate the effect and they are going to, uh, dilate the afferent arterioles, increasing your renal plasma flow. So if we have a filtration fraction, which we say is GFR over renal plasma flow, if your plasma flow increases, what's going to happen to your filtration and that should decrease a little bit. Now, the ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and that will cause a constrictory effect of the efferent arterioles. Why angiotensin 2? If you have low amount of volume reaching your glomerulus, you will stimulate your JG cells. JG cells will produce renin, and you start the cascade of renin angiotensin aldosterone, which we later be covered. So if your GFR overall, if your GFR is too high, then the substance cannot be what? Reabsorbed. 
quickly enough so because most of it will be lost in the urine that's like getting a car uh, and trying to do a right or a left turn at 120 miles per hour right it's, it goes too fast you need time for that to be absorbed like in your digestive system you need time for the food to be absorbed through your uh, capillary bed so if your GFR is too slow then what's going to happen if it's too low then everything is going to get reabsorbed means including even your waste products that these are your what you normally or naturally will be disposed into the form of urine so how do we are going to regulate our glomerular filtration and what type of uh, cells and hormones will allow us to regulate it. So number one, we have intrinsically or extrinsically. Well, intrinsically, we have our JG cells, as mentioned before, your Jungsta glomerular cells. This one's, uh, the cells, are going to release renin angiotensin, it's going to stimulate the renin angiotensin aldosterone cascade. Now, with this intrinsic system, you have two subsystems, which are myogenic and or flow dependent. The myogenic is the response to changes in pressure in the renal blood vessel. What does this mean? So if you're responding to a change, right in pressure in the blood vessels remember that we had a afferent your glomerulus and efferent if your blood pressure is high what's going to happen then your afferent arterioles you're going to vasodilate and your efferent you will vaso dilate so that way your overall n net filtration pressure will maintain your gfr will be kept and your pressure will be lower and that way it will be protecting your glomerulus when your blood pressure is low if the amount of plasma pressure blood pressure or plasma pressure is increased then your afferent arterioles will produce a constriction and your efferent arterioles if you need to filter more they will produce a constriction as well by doing so now you have increased the pressure in the afferent arterial so here you have an increase in pressure now you got more blood you got an increase in pressure entering at this level by constricting the efferent, you will close it and most more of that blood will stay here. So you have more time to do what? To reabsorb. That is your myenteric, your, that is your myogenic response. Now, what is the flow dependent? The flow dependent is your tubuloglomerular feedback. So what is your tubular glomerular feedback? And that is the feedback that changes with your Jungsta glomerular apparatus. What is your Jungsta glomerular apparatus? Those are your J, G cells. These cells, they are going to measure pressure. Whenever the pressure decreases of the blood plasma, the J, G cells will release Renin. 
So pressure and volume. So if the pressure or the volume is decreased, then renin is going to be released, is going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme. So the changes in the Johnston glomerular apparatus. What is the Johnston glomerular apparatus? JG cells. They are going to measure the amount of volume and or pressure. And when that happens, then you will release or stimulate the cascade event of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. Now, aldosterone will be reabsorption of the sodium. With that, you will increase the retention of water. Now, on the extrinsic event, extrinsically, you're going to have a neuronal control, means you will have epinephrine or norepinephrine being released. This epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to cause a basal effect on both the proximal and distal aspects. What are those? Well, that's going to be in your afferent or efferent arterioles. So here you have epinephrine in both ends causing a basal motor effect. Hormonal mechanisms like renin angiotensin aldosterone, which is part of both the flow dependent that is linked to the extrinsic mechanism here. Why extrinsic? Because renin now is going to leave your kidney circulation and is going to convert tensinogen to angiotensin which is the active form. By doing so, you also going to stimulate your atrial natriuretic peptide. Renin will stimulate the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin. This conversion will lead to an increase in sodium because of the high production of aldosterone and as a side effect you're going to have an increase in water now water means what water means that you have an increase in plasma volume increasing plasma volume causes a more volume going into your heart. So there's more volume getting into your right atrium. So your right atrium will dilate. It may or may not give you an S3. And now you stimulate a hormone produced in your atrium known as the atrial natriuretic peptide just to maintain a normal balance of your plasma volume and or blood pressure. So med on the medulla, there, so there will be a decrease in medullary reabsorption of sodium once the atrial natriuretic peptide is active. There will be an inhibition of angiotensin II as well as aldosterone, and there will be an inhibition of ADH production and or release. So what other regulations of this glomerular filtration happens? We're going to go into the detail of vasodilation and vasoconstriction of both the A and the efferent. So what molecules will cause a vasodilatory event? 
So that will be nitric oxide. That also will be your prostaglandins E2 and prostaglandin I2. Will produce a vasodilation in response to sympathetic stimulation and angiotensin 2. So, in other words, they will cause more blood volume to go through the afferent arterioles. On the vasoconstrictory event, we have your adenosines and we have the endothelin. Adenosine is a vasoconstrictor. So, if there's a constriction of the afferent arterioles, then What's going to happen? When do we use it, in other words? We're using this one when your volume of plasma is decreased, you will stimulate a vasal constriction by adenosine leading to an increase in the pressure just to maintain your net filtration pressure. And you use the same with endothelium.